Well, what's up, y'all? Welcome to the next episode. I hope you're having a fantastic week. So glad you made it and that you're taking the time out of your busy schedule to learn and grow today. Now, if you're ready to start creating your own economy and taking back control of your life, go to attorneybydesign.com and download the Freedom Blueprint and get into my circle so we can get started in creating passive income together soon. All right. Just to give you a little insight into the types of commercial real estate assets that I look into, you know, multifamily is always at the top of my list. But as cap rates compress, competition gets crazy high, and we approach what could be the back nine of this really, really long real estate cycle that we're in, it pays to take a contrarian point of view. Don't be a lemming. Don't follow the flock off the cliff. Think about where the rare opportunities can be. Sometimes you'll find them where you least expect. Build to rent communities, mobile home parks, RV parks, repurposing office buildings and big box retail, things like that. Keep an open mind. Our guest of honor today, Jefferson Lilly, started investing in assets like this long before many folks even considered mobile home parks such a valuable and viable investment. Jefferson is the founder of Park Avenue Partners, a self-made millionaire, mobile home park investment expert, educator, and an industry consultant. His fund owns 17 mobile home parks coast to coast, totaling over 32 million of value. Before launching the fund, he spent seven years investing his own capital, acquiring and operating mobile home parks. All right, let's get started. This is the Passive Income Attorney Podcast where you'll discover the secrets and strategies of the ultra wealthy on how they build streams of passive income to give them the freedom we all want. Attorney Seth Bradley will help you end the cycle of trading your time for money so you can make money while you sleep. Start living the good life on your own terms. Now, here's your host, Seth Bradley. Jefferson, what's going on, brother? Welcome to the show. (laughs) Great to be here, Seth. How are you? Uh, doing great, man. Doing great. Uh, happy to have you on the show. Let's uh, let's just jump right in. What's your story? And feel free to feel free to brag a little bit. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, I'll kind of give the backstory prior to uh, getting into the mobile home park business. Sure. I uh, spent most of my twenties as kind of the the guy behind the spreadsheet. Uh, I was doing financial analysis and consulting work. Um, uh, again, was, was heavily numbers and spreadsheet oriented, went to business school, uh, then came out here to uh, San Francisco to the Silicon Valley area, uh, worked at three different startups in sales. So now I was uh, the guy with the expense account, uh, taking people out to lunch um, <clears throat> and went through the dot-com boom and bust and semi-resurgence and basically just decided I wanted to have some additional uh, income, something stable, something to smooth out the stock options. And I started researching, this now goes back to about 2005, I started researching uh, uh, apartment buildings. I figured, you know, I'm uh, I'm a big fan of Warren Buffett, uh, not in his league as an investor, but <laughs> try and try and try to be. Uh, and you know- I don't think there's too many today. that are. <laughs> yeah. He advises staying within your circle of competence. I figured, hey, even though I've never owned real estate, I've lived in an apartment building. (laughs) Therefore, that must be my circle of competence. Um, Anyway, so then just in researching multifamily, going to uh, sites like LoopNet, filtering for multifamily leads, uh, you know, I kept finding 99, you know, apartment buildings in a certain metro. And uh, there would be then like one mobile home park that, had a higher cap rate, right? A lower price. And um, Seth, of course, I initially thought that's absurd. I'm not buying a friggin' trailer park. Are you kidding me? (laughs) So I deleted the search and did the search, you know, again and again, I was looking not here in the Bay Area. I was looking for cash flow, you know, but places like Peoria, Illinois and Omaha, Nebraska and Lubbock, Texas, probably got hit over the head five or 10 times with these mobile home parks. uh, And finally then decided, hey, you know, if these things really are more profitable, why don't I look into them? Um, and I did that and it then became apparent pretty quickly why it's such a compelling and interesting niche. Um, I ended up buying a couple of parks on my own, doing some consulting uh, for some other uh, high net worth families with interests in mobile home parks. 
uh, and then about seven years ago now started raising outside capital. Um, so I now have several funds and uh, we're getting ready to launch our next fund later this month here at, at, at Park Avenue Partners. Um, I did actually keep that day job in tech for about a year. I overlapped, so I sort of eased into real estate. I never said like, hey, I'm just quitting my job and giving up this sexy stock options and going into real estate full time. Um, it, it certainly didn't happen overnight. So I actually kept my day job for about a year, bought my first mobile home park. And again, kind of had a relatively easy transition from uh, one income stream to the other. That's awesome, man. Well, congrats on that. I mean, it only took a year. I mean, you, you said you did it gradually, but one year to most folks sounds like, wow, you're able to kind of get out of your day job in a pretty short amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was. Um, uh, again, and so what I ended up doing was not only having that first park then, but then did some consulting uh, in the industry and again, then bought another park. But yeah, that's how I transitioned. Uh, I did it over the, the span of about a year. Uh, it was frankly rather easy. That last startup I was at was not doing real well. Mm. And I could see that my first mobile home park was doing reasonably well. And I was putting no time or money into it. So I, again, sort of figured, why don't I do this full time, put some more money uh, into it, some more time. And um, uh, so here I am now about four, 14 years later, and I've bought, uh, I've sold some, but, but cumulatively, I think I've bought, I believe it's 36 uh, mobile home parks over the last 14 years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And, and it sounds like your W-2 was pretty conducive to kind of getting into commercial real estate, at least some of the, the skills that you learned there. I mean, you said you were spreadsheet oriented, um, yep. you know, underwriting commercial real estate is always on, you know, your Excel spreadsheet, whatever uh, analyzer you use, it, it's all the same. You've got to know your ways in and out of that and, and know your numbers. That, that's what commercial yep. real estate comes down to. And then you also yep. said you're you're a relationship guy. You're schmoozing with with people. I mean, yeah, that's what commercial real estate's all about as well, man. You've got to get in there and talk to the brokers and talk to the owners and and just talk be to able the to banks, schmooze the to the banks, the, talk to the banks. Exactly. Help, got help to, me go into debt over my eyeball, please, Mister Banker. <laughs> please help me. Help me. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, so one thing you mentioned. Take me back to that. You know, we always talk about the inflection point, that aha moment, kind of where you were just like in your day job, your W-2, and you said, I, something's not right here. Like, I, I need to look outside of, you know, the stock market or your 401k, outside of your single, you know, income stream. Yeah. You know, what did that look like for you? And, you know, what did that thought process or how did that come about? Well, so there were a couple of things. So, you know, the first startup I was at, uh, we... Uh, you know, started off, we were working in our three respective bedrooms. We didn't even have office space. It was 1999. We raised some money. Things went well. Then in late March and April of 2000, you know, the dot-com bubble imploded. A lot of things changed. We actually did sell that company. Uh, but, you know, kind of beyond my control, then I had changed jobs in a year and a half or something as our company got bought. I still got a job with the new company and my stock options converted. Fortunately, it was a publicly traded company, another tech company. So I had, I had stock options. Um, but you know, then that company subsequently didn't do that well. Uh, and then I had to go look elsewhere. And so tech, you know, it's wonderful if, if you land at you know, Google or Facebook and you've got a nice long run. Uh, for better or for worse, the startups I was at seemed to be getting acquired or downsizing or merging like every two years. Um, and that was a little unnerving. Uh, and I just like working on kind of longer term projects. So that all kind of got me, I, I think, thinking about owning real estate, something that I could do, you know, regardless of kind of what, what the day job situation was. Um, so that, that was kind of progressive, I guess, uh, evolution, awakening over the first couple of, uh, of companies. Uh, and then again, in that last year, when I could see like, hey, this really seems to work. I've got this side income. I'm not putting much time or money into it, but you know, I've got enough imagination as to what it could be if I did it full time, you know, then, then that kind of cinched, cinched the deal for me. <laughs> so 
Yeah, I love that, man. I mean, we, we always say that it, there's nothing riskier than having one stream of income, right? Like mo yeah. most people think of having a really good job is the safest thing you can do, but it's not because you're, you're tied to one stream of income. Something happens to that stream and you have no backup plans. All you have is that 401k that you're not even allowed to touch until you're 65 years old. Well, you're old like me, Seth, but some, someday you'll get to touch your 401k. I'll let someday. you know what it's like. I'm going to get there sooner than you. All right. Let me, let me know how that works out. I think you've got, the, got that beat by now. But, but, you know, I mean, a lot of our listeners can appreciate that too. I mean, a lot of them are attorneys and it's like, you know, their industries can go up and down and yes. people get laid off if they don't hit their billable hours. It's just, right. you know, you've got to. Or, or in this day and age, you can get canceled. <laughs> yeah. If you say something slightly wrong, yeah. Yeah. boom, there goes your career. Or yeah, something you said 20 years ago. <laughs> right. Right. It's not even back when it was politically correct to talk that way. And then yeah. it comes back and haunts you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's ridiculous, man. That's why you've got to you gotta have multiple streams of, of income. Uh, yeah. it's, it's awesome that you, you know, you figured that out. A lot of people they have to have something, you know, monumental happen that's you know not a positive event in their life to, yeah. to realize that. So that, that's great that you're able to figure that out. And you, you had the foresight to, to, to move into alternative assets. Yep. So let, let's dive into the mobile home parks, man. That, I mean, that's your yep. bread and butter. So we talked about how you got started, but, you know, tell the listeners you know, why this asset class. I mean, I think your initial reaction to it what is similar to most people when they hear about <laughs> it is like, wait, mobile home parks? Like, I don't, I don't want to invest in mobile home parks. That's, that's just like, you know, that, that doesn't even sound right. But then, you know, that's a lot of smart money goes there because the returns yeah. are there or they, they used to be. They're a little bit softer now, but, but it's still there. It's still strong. Yeah. And it's so, so why this asset class? So a couple of things. First, Unlike virtually every other real estate asset class, senior housing, apartments, hotel, what have you, really only mobile home parks benefit from it now being effectively illegal to build any more mobile home parks. Uh, politicians on both sides of the aisle talk out of both sides of their mouths. They all say, oh, sure, you know, I'm all for affordable housing, but not in my backyard. I don't want to right. blow park in this town, <laughs> you know, put it in the next town over. Yep. So that's been going on, unfortunately, for probably, I guess, 30, 40 years now. A lot of these restrictions started coming in place in the 80s and 90s. Um, you know, this little town where I got my start, uh, Slaughterville, Oklahoma. Uh, and Oklahoma, you would think, would be a fairly pro-business part of the world. Uh, a couple of years after I bought my mobile home park there and started expanding it, started putting sweat equity into it, bringing in mobile homes, actually expanding that park and creating more affordable housing. What the town did was to pass legislation to help everyone. And they said it's uh, now illegal to build a house of any sort on anything less than two acres of land. Wow. Now, most mobile home <laughs> parks are about 10 mobile homes per acre. So if you had two acres of land, you would have 20 affordable housing units. But by them saying, no, you have to have two acres of land around that front door, you, of course, have to buy 20 times as much land. It's now not possible economically to build a mobile home park. Um, so we see that sort of thing quite frequently where they don't literally say it's illegal to build a mobile home park, but they change yeah. the zoning, they change the density, and they do effectively outlaw it without being so discriminatory as to say no more mobile home parks, but they're very right. sly, these people in government, <laughs> and they find a way to outlaw uh, affordable housing. So there'll also never be any more apartment buildings built in that town. It's the same thing for all housing. There'll just never be any more lower income people allowed to live in that city. That kind of thing, if that's happening in a red state like Oklahoma, you can only imagine what the regulations are like in blue states like California, where I live. So unfortunately, government really has a war on affordable housing. Um, 
But what that does mean is that if you own one of these, you'll never have any more competition. Uh, competi you, you have competition, there are other mobile home parks, there just will never be any more. So that obviously uh, is a good thing if you're a landowner, if you own a park. Um, anyways, that's one of the key reasons. Another key reason this is a good business is uh, at least the way we play it, we help people become homeowners. We will sell them their house. We provide the financing. Most of our folks get into a house for less than five grand down, some for around $1,000 down. But we help them own homes in two to maybe 15 years. Um, but the implication there is that all those proverbial leaky toilets and leaky roofs are on the tenant to maintain. Uh, so again, unlike an apartment building where the landlord has to maintain all that infrastructure, in our world, we're selling that to tenants. Uh, and lo and behold, when you give somebody a shot at home ownership, uh, even if they were, frankly, a mediocre or poor rental tenant in an apartment, they can get into one of our communities for at least a couple of hundred bucks less a month, begin saving money immediately, and get on that path to being a homeowner. And lo and behold, they start behaving better and treating that house better. And the toilets don't leak as much and the roofs don't leak as much. Uh, so it's a win-win for everyone. The tenants become owners. They get out of the game of paying rent. They're gonna own that house. Um, and then for us, it's a win because we don't have to do as much maintenance. We of course still maintain the grounds, the roads, the plumbing, the stuff in the land. Um, but simply the reduced maintenance uh, versus apartment buildings makes mobile home parks uh, a winner uh, in my view. Gotcha. Yeah, just rewinding a little bit. I mean, the government just, they, well, at least to the outward public, they scream, you know, we need affordable housing, affordable housing, affordable housing. But then when you dive in a little bit deeper, there's nothing, nothing could to be further with. from the truth. You know? Exactly. Or if they're going to do anything affordable housing, they're going to build their own projects. Government is going to own all of the bricks and mortar. And government is never going to sell that. Government is going to trap people into being tenants forever and never let them build up ownership of anything. So that's the way government solves the affordable housing problem. <laughs> solves. <laughs> yeah. Uh, based on your on your other comment, I, I take it that you prefer that the owner owned trailers rather than the the, the park owned model. Correct. That's the way we play it. We don't want to have what I colloquially call a horizontal apartment building. Uh, again, we want folks to own those houses. We, we ourselves, of course, benefit from having the lower maintenance and more stable tenants, right? People that are buying houses tend to stay around a lot longer than renters. Um, and while we are you know, certainly a for-profit partnership, we do have a social mission, and that's to expand the supply of affordable housing. So we think it's wonderful that what's right for society to get people out of apartments or even out of projects and give them a house, sorry, sell them a house that they're going to own. We think that's right social policy. And it also lines up with our pocketbook. We're, we're happy to have the lower maintenance um, and frankly focus on buying more land rather than buying you know, ever more houses that we then own indefinitely we, we just even when we buy a mobile home park that comes with mobile homes uh we offer all the renters the chance to buy the house uh typically with no step up in rent or payment they just keep their payments the same and we're going to offer them the chance to become an, a, a homeowner if they want unfortunately not all of them take us up on that but we do make that available as an option to people uh, already renting in our communities yeah, yeah. And maybe I should have rewound a little bit. Would you mind explaining? It's kind of self-explanatory, but probably not for, for beginners. You know, could you explain park-owned versus owner-owned? Yeah, so we call them either park-owned, a POH, or resident-owned, an ROH. Uh, so a typical deal for us would be, say, we buy a 100-space park, maybe it comes with 80 resident-owned homes, ROHs. Those are people that own that mobile home. It's effectively parked on the land. They own the home, we own the land. Uh, a typical park might then have maybe another 10 park owned homes. Usually those are being rented. Uh, again, we'll then offer people the chance to rent to own the homes. 
typically those those are older homes. Typically, they'll people will become homeowners in two to maybe five years, and then again there might be say another ten completely vacant pads. Uh, so we'll go out and buy typically brand new mobile homes, uh, and typically that's running now around fifty thousand dollars. So we would invest in that case, say another half a million, buy ten new houses, bring those in, and then. Uh, we'll arrange financing on them. Uh, so folks do not need to go to a bank. Uh, they can finance it with us. or one of our financing partners and they then are on a rent to own agreement uh, to, to end up purchasing those brand new homes. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thanks for that. So let's maybe jump into some of the, you know, some of the criteria that you're looking for. I mean, what what makes you know one mobile home park better than the next when you're trying to break down whether or not a deal is a good one so that you can bring that to, to some of your investors? So we're looking typically to acquire parks in metro areas of 50,000 people or greater. Uh, we've found that particularly small metros just tend to not have great economies and it's just tough to make a go of it in this real estate niche or probably most real estate niches if you've kind of got a two or 5,000 person town you know, with no stoplight. <laughs> yeah. So we're typically looking metros of 50,000 and up. And then also where the average house price is $100,000 and up. Uh, again, our houses will come in at 50,000. Um, in places, for instance, like Detroit, that are a much larger, you know, still couple million person metro, there are a lot of houses in Detroit that you can have for 25 and 35,000. We, right. we can't compete with that. Uh, that's also a sign of a very weak economy. We prefer tenants with, with better jobs. So we generally, again, are looking to buy in metros where the average house price is 100,000 and up. We can then offer a house around 50, maybe 60, and people will will jump at that. That's a lot more affordable than a hundred thousand dollar and a house. Um, then we're also looking, for instance, generally to be within five miles of a super Walmart. Uh, that both is a validation that that town is at least stable. Um, Walmart does their research pretty well. If Walmart has invested in building a super Walmart, and we're within five miles of it, that that also is a great proof point. Um, so those are a couple of things that can be easily researched. Uh, we then do far more. You know, we've got several pages of diligence that we go through. We'll also run test ads and see really what the demand is for housing there. Um, and we'll also learn about how the previous owner has managed the park. For instance, has that previous manager just let anybody into a mobile home park, done no background check and taking, taken no down payment? Uh, that means you're filtering effectively really for criminals that don't want their background checked. Um, I bought a park like that. Uh, it was rough. I, I bought it right. I bought it quite cheap, but I've had firsthand experience with really rough parks like that again, or does a manager really screen out anybody with, with, with a bad criminal background and does a, uh, the previous owner uh, set the standard relatively high for down payments? That means the park will be full of far better quality tenants. That also, again, make, makes a park uh, worth more money. Uh, those are the things you can't necessarily tell just from initially looking at a park. You really need to start digging in on diligence to really understand how the park has been managed. Um, anyway, so those are some of the, the, the top things on our two-page list of diligence items that, that we look for in parks. Yeah, that's interesting, man. I mean, so it sounds like it, it, you know, a lot of this stuff is similar to, you know, if you're, if you're underwriting a, a multifamily property, I mean, you like to stay in kind of a larger, larger area with a large population. Hopefully it's increasing. Hopefully there's some job diversity and in, in, in jobs. I mean, jobs, everybody, people follow the jobs, right? Um, and then comparing yep. kind of your ownership yes. price to the rental price. It's, it's very similar. You compared your, yep. you know, the, the ownership price of a house compared to, you know, what you have to pay for a new trailer. And I, the, the five miles of uh, near a super Walmart was really interesting, right? <laughs> yep. 
Yeah, because sometimes we look at like saying Whole Foods or, or Starbucks or something like that to try to figure out the neighborhood. But this, you know, Walmart's if you can be within five miles of a Tiffany's jewelry store, you <laughs> definitely, definitely got that's a, a winner. Park worth buying. That, I'm that just is not a sure winner. anywhere in America there are mobile home parks <laughs> within five miles of a Tiffany's. But if you could go there, that would be the thing. <laughs> maybe, maybe out here in SoCal, man, there's there's uh, there's yeah. a few mobile home parks that are right on the coast. They've got the best view in the whole city. <laughs> you know, and if, if you can get those for anything better than like a two cap, you know, you're a better man than I. So this still also has to be reasonably priced for us to yeah. be interested in a deal. So. Of course, of course. And well, so more and more people are finding out about this, right? So, you know, what kind of return profiles are you, you know, generally offering your investors at this point? So uh, the way I work is, is typically just on a straight up 50-50 split of profits. I take no salary, no fees. I put my house up as personal collateral to guarantee the debt. Um, uh, and, and, and we just split 50-50. Uh, I do sometimes offer a, a preferred return uh, on, on some shares uh, at about 6% that uh, then get 10% of additional upside. Uh, but frankly, I think investors are going to make more money just being straight up 50-50 partners with me. Um, so I've been generally uh, generating double digit returns for investors, uh, 12 to 15 percent, roughly. Again, past performance, no guarantee of, of future of performance, uh, but we pay out quarterly. Uh, so investors might expect, say, on average, you know, over a roughly 10 year hold period, maybe they'd be getting six or seven percent cash per year. And then when we sell, they should get back, no guarantees, they should get back their principal plus uh, another large chunk of change. So that then might add another five or seven percent of IRR just from, say, doubling your money over 10 years is something around a six and a half, seven IRR. Again, we then also pay out cash, um, uh, five, six, seven percent, so all in. Uh, investors are getting to a double digit rate of return. We also uh, generate for tax purposes uh, with all the accelerated depreciation, we generate pretty significant losses and folks should be able to write off pretty close to all of their investment, uh, which can also be, I mean, you're going to get a nice refund check from the IRS or, you know, right. deducted against other income. Um, so we do do cost segregation studies. Um, and for tax purposes, we, we try and lose as much money as humanly possible. <laughs> our, our investors like that. <laughs> of course, those, those paper losses are really valuable. Very yeah. valuable. Yeah. So, all right, let's switch gears a little bit because I've heard you talk about this before and it's really interesting to me. Tell me about how you've been able to scale so quickly and, and then we'll maybe get into kind of this 2.0 business concept. Yeah, so... As I mentioned earlier, I came into this business from working a day job, and I survived, uh, uh, frankly, uh, at some of those early startups when a lot of my colleagues didn't survive layoffs. I did that by making myself invaluable to the business. I was working long, hard hours. I was taking on additional responsibility. Uh, so what was ingrained in me was, you know, Income is related to being indispensable. Uh, and I've had, I'm still going through it. I uh, still haven't completed this transition as well as I should, but I'm still working on shifting to my new mentality, which is that the best way to generate income is to become irrelevant to the business. <laughs> That's quite a step <laughs> change from irreplaceable like to irrelevant. Well, yeah. how and why would I be irrelevant? So uh, I, I, I've scaled up. I've hired people now, for instance, to do my books. Uh, Seth, the first four months I was in this business, I did my own QuickBooks. You know, I wanted to learn and do everything, and I could do almost everything. I never actually swung a hammer uh, in in my my properties, but you know, I did answer phones. I did QuickBooks. I was my own asset manager, basically overseeing the crews that were doing work. Um, I was doing my own uh, marketing on Craigslist and Facebook and elsewhere. I've now hired people to do that. So I try and focus on basically raising money and finding deals 
and then turning the you know throwing the deals over the fence as it were to my team to actually manage once I get the money raised for them and get them acquired. Um, but still, I probably need to bring on another person or two to help me source deals, do investor relations, uh, you know, a- analyze and close on deals. So I'm still not irrelevant to my business, but I've become semi irrelevant. And lo and behold, you know, I've been able to grow beyond that first deal when I was doing it. We were bringing in homes. Uh, you know, I, I was buying homes that were generally pretty rough. Again, overseeing the crews that were fixing them up. I was sleeping on site one out of every three weeks in one of my trailer. One of my trailers. I actually lived yeah. in that park about <laughs> one third time. Um, I love the hustle. You know, that was definitely that, that was a full time job. And now I've still got a full time job, but now you know I've got about twenty parks that, that I'm responsible for. Um, so again, I've been able to grow uh, by getting closer to being irrelevant uh, to my business. So big, big mind shift. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's good to learn everything at first, at least, you know, get a, a you know, a, a base level of, of what's going on so that you can properly assign those tasks and, and hire people to do those jobs. You've kind of got to know a little bit about them to be able to do it yeah. or you're not going to be able to even hire effectively. Yep. That's right. Man. But the irreplaceable as an employee to irrelevant as an entrepreneur that's yeah. that's awesome that that's powerful you, you need to write a book on that that's trust me about the irrelevance part <laughs> <laughs> all right jefferson before jumping into the freedom for one last golden nugget for our listeners uh you know, I, I would say one thing that really helped me was building uh, an unofficial advisory board. Uh, when I got started in this niche, I uh, found by networking, I, I found about 10 guys that had all owned mobile home parks, and they were quite generous with their time helping me to get educated. I would then bring them deals and they might say, hey, thumbs up or thumbs down or, you know, I don't know, but the key issue is x jefferson go figure out x about this deal and then you'll know so at least for me i mean i did as much book learning as i could but i think my learning really kicked into high gear when i was running deals by uh more experienced industry veterans so whatever your niche is going to be whatever the business is i would say build yourself that sort of an unofficial advisory board uh, of people that have been there and done that and Kick, kick your learning into high gear that way. Yeah, yeah. Get a mentor, get a coach, get an advisory board, get get someone in your life that's, that's already been there, done that, doing what you want to do. Yep. All right, let's jump into the Freedom Four. It's time for the Freedom Four. What's the best thing you do to keep your mind and body healthy? Uh, it's still probably doing a lot of that networking with other park owners. Um, some of those same guys and some new guys that I've met, uh, and we're always kind of trading industry tips and tricks and stuff. Uh, so that helps uh, all on the mind. Um, I wish I did more to keep the body healthy. I got to put on some <laughs> shoes and go for a run, get get my butt out of this chair and go do something to get more physically <laughs> healthy. So that's that's the bane of my existence, Seth. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. You'll, you'll get there, man. You'll get there. What's one life hack you use to be your most productive self? Um, you know, uh, I, I do like reading. And again, that's all part of part of learning. Um, sure. uh, so I recently read Sam Zell's book, uh, Am I Being Too Subtle? Uh, Sam's a self-made billionaire and is the world's largest mobile home park owner. Uh, although he made most of his billions in office and apartment uh, but anyway, doing things like that to figure out, like, how did he grow his business so far beyond where I'm at? Uh, but, but I love biographies in particular, but, but, but reading that, uh, those sorts of books, uh, uh, I, I really enjoy. Cool. What, what's one actionable step our listeners can do right now to start creating more freedom for themselves? Uh, again, I would say take action. Uh, you certainly do need to learn about something, but uh, don't be, you know, don't use learning and reading as an excuse for taking action. At some point, you just kind of need to jump in. Uh, so for me, that went again from from reading, from book learning, 
to then spending about a year kind of networking with, with people that were in this business, running deals by them, uh, and then buying my first park. So I'd say think about that sort of uh, transition and, and get in the game. Best time yeah. to buy real estate was yesterday. Second exactly. best time is today. <laughs> <laughs> How has passive income made your life better? Just the, the, the freedom to, to travel. Uh, you know, we took off, uh, for instance, last month, my wife and I and our three kids, we went down to Texas. We bought a, uh, an RV park with a lot of mobile homes in it. Um, but we just rented an RV. We took our kids with us. Uh, we homeschool. Uh, so we had the flexibility to just kind of go on a working, schooling vacation uh, for actually a little over two weeks down near South Padre Island. Nice. Uh, so working for ourselves coupled with homeschooling our kids means we can be responsible parents, we can have an income, but we can also just sort of take off and go someplace for a couple of weeks and not be tied to a school system or an office or day job. Um, so you can get all that working, <laughs> the homeschooling, <laughs> the kids and, and the work fr from home income. Uh, it, it really opens up a lot of interesting opportunities in life. Yeah. Freedom, man. Even, even with kids, right? <laughs> even with kids. That's right. Yeah. Next trip, we'll have them driving the RV. There we go. Yeah. Put them, put them to work. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We did have them picking up trash. Oh, I make, I make my kids, they're three, five, and seven. I made them work in the business. We, I marched them out every morning from the RV and we had, went and picked up trash and threw it away in the dumpster. So they're, they're already working. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's some tax loops in there you can utilize too. <laughs> Yeah, don't don't tell anybody I'm employing child labor. Anyway. <laughs> All right, Jefferson, it's been great, man. Where can our listeners find out more about you? Okay. Uh, yeah, they can uh, find us uh, at our website, parkavenuepartners.com. Right at the top center, we've got a uh, sign up button to get on our mailing list to find out about the upcoming fund and, and what deals we're buying. Uh, there's also just a contact us button there at the top of the page. Uh, so if somebody's got specific questions, they can just co contact me uh, or somebody in our investor relations department that way. So again, parkavenuepartners.com. Awesome, man. It's great having you on, on the show. Thanks, Seth. Have a great day. You too. All right. Jefferson really knows his stuff. You can find his interviews on Bigger Pockets and some other wildly successful shows. He certainly has a great story to tell and lots of knowledge to share. Major keys. Look, if, if you're listening to this show, you're already leading the Wall Street Rebellion or at least considering joining the cause. You've had enough of the stock market roller coaster and want to get into some hard assets, create alternative income streams, and cut your dependency on trading hours for dollars. That's a great start. Getting the right mindset, getting educated. And then you need to start looking around. Take a survey of the land, try to discover those opportunities that others just aren't seeing, or maybe they're just too scared to act on. To learn more about breaking the chains of Wall Street, go to attorneybydesign.com and download our free guide to investing in alternative assets. Have a great rest of your day. Signing off. Enjoy the journey. Thank you for listening to the Passive Income Attorney Podcast with Seth Bradley. Do you want more ideas on how to generate multiple streams of passive income? Then jump over to PassiveIncomeAttorney.com for show notes and resources. Then apply for the private Facebook community by searching for the Passive Income Attorney on Facebook. And we'll see you on the next episode.